Hi, this is Ann Wagner, and I'm coming to you with another short presentation from the curatorial side of Winter Tour Museum in Delaware. And as you can probably guess, we are missing all of you, our wonderful museum and garden visitors. We're missing the art and the objects that we care for at Winter Tour. But like curators around the globe, I've been working at home. And today I thought I'd tell you about some of the research in the organics collection that I've been doing thanks to a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Now I don't mean organics like these beautiful daffodils, but hard matrix organics used in the decorative arts. So instead, imagine you are standing in this part of the winter tour garden with the wind gently breezing around you, maybe tousling your hair a bit if you have any, because today's topic really indirectly touches on hair. And I've been thinking about all the funny social media posts we've seen regarding the need for haircuts and of the recent trend for beard and mustache combs. And I thought you might enjoy a brief look at how we are studying historic hair combs at Wintertour. So I'm going to begin by dialing our time clock backward about 200 years, just after the War of 1812 concluded. And that's when this young woman from Pennsylvania was of the right age to be married or at least that's what her portrait is telling us. You can see her pictured in this divinely sweet pink dress with a fashionable collar that opens up like petals to frame her face and her rosebud mouth. Her dark hair is wound tightly on the back of her head rather than down her back. And in case you missed the message, she's holding a perfectly color coordinated single rose to communicate her blossoming age. This watercolor holds interest for me because like many of the young ladies from the rural communities painted by Jacob Mantel, who is the watercolor artist here, she's wearing hair combs and they're made from horn like these on the right. You can see a close up detail of her face here on the left. Now, there certainly weren't any steer in the pastures of Pennsylvania with such translucently golden horns on their head. But you can see in a talented comb maker's hands and with a little bit of application of lead oxide and some other minerals they could really decorate the surface of horn and transform it into these appealing hair ornaments. I think you can see the one in the lower right actually looks quite a bit with that repeated design like the one that our lady in pink is wearing on her head. In fact the American fashion craze for ladies back and side combs hit its stride by about 1820, 200 years ago. Ornamental combs were sartorial, of course, but they were affordable luxuries. And this profile portrait of another Pennsylvania lady shows her wearing a very prominent hair comb. I'll give you a detail on, on the left. She's actually wearing it quite high, perhaps uh, less to hold her hair in place and more to feature its rich, faux tortoiseshell surface for anybody who's looking at the back of her head. You might also see that she's wearing a small comb on the side of her head, just above her ear, one on each side, those are called side combs. And they were there to hold this artificially curled lock in just the right position. I found in an American women's very popular magazine, Godey's Ladies Book, that there was a recommendation for young ladies to wear curls just ahead of their ears on the cheek or in ringlets a la anglaise or the English style like our lady in pink was wearing, uh, perhaps enhanced with a little garland of flowers as they did in Paris. So while her straight hair and this very perfectly geometric side curl on this woman may not look like a fashion plate from 1820, I'm sure in her eyes, she was dressed as high style as her emerald green purse contents could manage. And I do have to emphasize that I think in this era, 200 years ago, it was a fascinating moment for comb makers. And around the globe, in parts of Asia, as well as in Spain and her colonies, certainly in many African cultures, hair ornaments had deep cultural meanings. Several countries even had sumptuary laws that were regulating how combs and men combs were worn. But is it a coincidence in this time period that when the U.S. purchased Florida territory from Spain in 1819, comb makers here in this country were exporting finished combs in horn to Havana in Cuba? 
Also, in 1822, the prolific Japanese printmaker, and that's what I'm showing you on the lower left here, um, Katsushika Hokusai created a design book that included designs for ornamental combs. And you can see the ones on the left are just ink drawings of what was probably going to become lacquer work. This is the same time, so it's very interesting to me. And don't forget that images of women's hairstyles in China were available through the trade in, with America, certainly in paintings or maybe even in figures like this porcelain figure on the right and, and in other media. And the woman on the right is a nodding head figure and she's one of a pair that was made for export for what Americans and Europeans thought or wanted Chinese women to look like rather than an authentic portrait of a woman from China. And in the same way, in the middle there, I'm showing you a much later trade card. This is for the Singer Sewing Machine Company, and it's from the Winotor Library. But here you can see a couple from Valencia in Spain. And this woman is wearing a hair comb very prominently on the back of her head while she's sewing at her new machine. So my larger point here is that by 1820, hair combs were international. They were cross-cultural, interracial, and signifiers of so many different things, and they were very popular. Now, of course, a much more rare and more expensive ornamental back comb at this time period was made from tortoiseshell, or maybe, as you see on the left, or from ivory, from the tusk of an elephant, or in lacquer, or in silver, like the one you see on the right. These two are both from Winotor's small collection of hair combs. And the silver one is a slightly later date from the mid-century, but it's showing a shift in fashion um, and a taste for smaller hair ornaments. The larger one, the earlier one on the left, is hand-carved from a prepared and shaped, contoured, large piece of what they call shell or tortoise shell. And this is actually material from the hawk's bill or the green turtle, sea turtles, that was carved and pierced and engraved with very delicate artistry, similar to hand fans and other ornaments like that. This type of comb first came from Canton in China or from Paris, but the demand was so high, American comb makers quickly filled the niche as well. And in 1831, there were more than 80 related comb businesses just in New York City's directory. Tortoiseshell comb manufacturers specifically were soon established in Charleston, in Alexandria, Virginia, in New York, in Boston, and Rhode Island. And sadly, that is, of course, one of the reasons marine turtle populations are so endangered today. But um, American horn workers' skill sets and their tools were adapted very quickly to this newly popular fashion for ornamental combs. They, so in addition to working tortoiseshell, they also explored known recipes but in new ways to simulate tortoiseshell colors on cow horn by dyeing them with brown, black, yellow, green, and even rich, rich red. So the one on the left is meant to really mimic uh, tortoiseshell colors with that golden honey color and brown. These were so successful in the marketplace. I found a, a reference for a, a dry goods merchant in Connecticut in 1824 and he was advertising he had more than 500 such imitation back combs. So they were horn combs in imitation of tortoiseshell, 500 in stock in 1824. So if you didn't have funds or maybe an interest in such an ornate pierced or dyed hair comb, we don't want to forget that one, the one I'm showing you on the right, which is its natural pigmentation of a horn, um, this poor snaggletooth fragment of what was a very large back comb, this, this would have done as well. And so that was available in the marketplace and in the taste. But broken combs like this one don't typically end up in museum collections. And they really help us understand the process for how horn was transformed, as well as the range in cultural taste and retail preferences. So not everything was imitating tortoise shell. I want to pause just for a minute to think about the material because horn is one of the most prevalent of the harder organics. And if you think about where it comes from, it's for defense, absolutely. Uh, not quite like armor, of course, but very effective and very pointy. 
And I'm showing you here some of the heritage breeds that we know were a stock in America in the early 1800s. You probably think of powder horns when you look at these beautiful creatures. And that was a popular use for horn in its natural shape. But this material is incredibly versatile and it was used for everything from jewelry to furniture to drinking cups. It's keratin like your hair and thus the shape can be changed with heat and pressure and moisture, um, just like your hair curls perhaps on a, on a hot damp day. So you can manipulate horn when it's being used by a craftsman's hands. In fact, if you just think of the English language, the word horn has more than 100 uses as a noun and a verb and an adjective. Think about it, shoehorn, powder horn, lamped horn, lanthorn is what those were. French horn, car horn, or a geographic horn of Africa, or, or allegorical, the horn of plenty. I could go on and on. So our language reveals how useful horn was to humans, not to mention to the animals who were also being or supplying us with milk and meat and wool and hide. The heritage breeds, of course, are important to know, but in addition to cattle, there were sometimes goat horns that were used. This is a, a lovely Spanish goat, or um, certainly sheep. And I'll show you a heritage. Um, this is a Navajo churro sheep, uh, one of the Spanish colonial imports. And the rams, like this one, sometimes even had four horns. So very unusual, but typically it was coming from um, beef cattle. In addition to the museum's collection of a few actual combs and powder horns, we are fortunate that the library and the manuscripts collection are so diverse. And I can show you this lovely illustration of a hornsmith's workshop at the top, and then at the bottom, how a horn, a large horn, could be segmented into lots of different parts. It's solid at the tip and then has a core that's removed in the center. This is um, coming. Uh, in fact, when I, I was going to say when a segmented is spirally cut, you can lay it open and then by pressing it flat into a sheet, that's where a horn has so many different uses, especially if it then gets pressed to heat and clarified or made translucent um, into window panes or lantern panes and, and certainly into combs. So this image is from the vast encyclopedia of technical knowledge that was compiled and engraved by Dennis Diderot. He's showing you horn workers who are supplying horn to be then made into a faux tortoiseshell veneer for game tables. And horn was used this way on furniture right up through the Art Deco era. I also can show you from the same source uh, here another page of horn combs in lots of different shapes on the left and some of the tools on the right that were used to shape the combs and their teeth. Like other guilds, hornsmiths taught and regulated their craft for many generations. And so these illustrations from the 18th century are also informative for early America too. Now our Winter Tour Library also has a peddler's catalog from the early 1800s. And we do not know its origin, but it depicts many French luxury goods. And I'm showing you two pages from it that are showing um, ornamental and grooming hair combs. You can see that they are colored to suggest various finishes or perhaps even some different materials. They, they look so modern to me. It's amazing. I'm pretty sure I've held one of those combs on the right in my hand in my lifetime. Uh, they are, are straight or at the bottom or they have curved arced teeth. You can see, especially on the combs on the right side, that there are coarse or wide spaced teeth and fine or very close teeth. There's a variety that we're all being offered at the same time. And imported, in fact, there's a third page I'll show you of this detail of um, maybe more workmanlike um, coarse cutting. So you could be, imagine removing thistles from your hair rather than combing out lice with these particular combs. And certainly imported combs like these were advertised in early American newspapers. I found one ad from Boston dated 1839 um, and it was a fancy goods retailer, someone who had perfumes and, and ornaments as well. And he said he offered more than 200 different patterns of wrought, meaning pierced or engraved, or plain combs. And it went on to describe the choice of comb materials that he offered and 
You could have a comb made out of thorn or shell, being tortoise shell, ivory, wood, and perhaps these little ones in the center of my picture are actually wood, or metallic of, of every description. So there was a lot of variety and choice in the 1820s and 30s for a comb uh, purchaser. The American horn comb making story is important rather than just imports, and I find that it's very underexplored by historians. So thanks to a collection that Winotour acquired from a contemporary hornsmith today, we have this wooden frame that you see on the right showing you how hundreds of straight flattened blanks of horn were stacked tightly together. They're actually in two rows deep all the way down the length of that frame. And then they were seasoned for about six months and allowed to just really settle into being straight and flat before they were hand sawn or later by machine cut into teeth and made into combs. After the teeth were cut and filed, the combs were polished. And that's what I'm showing you on the left with this wonderful image, um, a woman in the Krauss family who is a farming family that had a comb making workshop in Pennsylvania. And she's actually holding a straight comb at the wheel and the wheel is corn husks. So she's polishing gently the teeth on a comb that looked a lot like this one, actually either one of these, these are both from that family manufactory. So you can see um, where they were producing combs like this in a home or a cottage manufactory. I mentioned earlier that I found by 1822, the American hair comb industry was booming and cottage production of straight combs like these now had competition from larger manufacturers who had regional distribution through peddlers, through jewelers and hardware and dry good merchants. This was so successful that the raw material could no longer be locally sourced. They couldn't get horns locally. Um, I was researching and in one year, just through one port in Charleston, South Carolina, 6,000 pairs of cattle horn were exported and dispersed into the, into the coastal trade. By the early 1800s, Americans and Europeans were importing raw cattle horn from South America by the hundreds of tons annually. England soon got squeezed out of this market because American demand was so high and they had to turn to Russia and to South Africa for their horn supplies. In 1832, I found the New York Spectator newspaper reporting that half of the horn combs produced in America came from Rhode Island and the revenue value of what was being produced in Rhode Island was 1.4 million dollars and at that time women were definitely working in comb manufactories and they were credited with raising the, the level to quite um, a beautiful perfection with their skills. So this is a huge and undertold story that I'm very interested in and I'm not going to get any further with it with you today because I'm pretty sure you're wondering, as I did, what happened to horn hair combs like these? Those highly ornamental combs were soon supplanted by plated metals, by steel, by newer materials like rubber, and as well as changing fashions, shorter hairstyles and fashion whims made us less interested in hair combs like that. This steel trimmed straight comb that I mentioned was made by hand and it was made by the last known American comb workshop in 1940s and 50s. I mentioned that at that time horn was in pretty short supply and even though we know that barbers and hospitals favored horn combs like this because they could be repeatedly sanitized, you could heat them and they wouldn't um, degrade and they lasted for years but early plastics moved into the marketplace. You may not realize this, but the DuPont company were suppliers of celluloid. And celluloid, this plastic was colored and uh, colored to look like tortoise shell and it supplanted the horn that of course had been colored to look like tortoise shell too. So plastics really pushed horn combs out of the marketplace. But look at what I'm showing you. This is from the 1920s. It was a beautifully made celluloid hair comb with fine and coarse teeth and a silver spine, the Gorham factory. But celluloid doesn't hold up over the years. As we now know, plastics in general don't age very well. So horn instead is a somewhat sustainable or renewable 
resource. It's also biodegradable. It's not going to, to harm the environment in any way. And if it's cared for well, that's why I could show you those beautiful horn combs that are nearly 200 years old. And I want to show you, actually, as I'm stopping, that um, we're very grateful to have those 200-year-old horn combs at Winter Tour. And I'm hoping, I'm looking forward to seeing you when we're all back at Winter Tour. I can show them to you when we're all a little bit better count. As you can see right now, I'm still waiting for that haircut. And I uh, look forward to seeing you again sometime and hope that you are enjoying these video series. Thank you.